हेलो प्रियंका मैम यस रागिनी मैडम हाँ सर ने अभी ज्वाइन किया था ना प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर अवले सर ने हाँ अवले सर ने किया था हाँ हेलो अर्चना मैडम
गुड इवनिंग रवि सर वेलकम प्रियंका शर्मा मैम अलॉन्ग विद आवर टीम में रागिनी जाधव मैम एंड प्रोफेसर अर्चना घाटुले मैम सो इज टीम लीडिंग विद स्टार्ट इन 5 मिनट्स Yeah. Six o'clock is the given time, so we'll start exactly at six. Sure, sure. No, sure. no. You enable space cleaning, right? Yeah. So. so I will be giving you the co-host, right? Yeah. That's so that right. you can present the video yeah. or the PPT, whatever you have. So yeah, yeah. Sure. Sure. So the rights are given. So the participants are internal, right, or outside? Or yes. Outside? Yeah. No, no, internal. Only internal. The management students are there. First time management students, as well as faculty members will be there. Okay. Yeah. So we already had one session with NEP in month of September. Okay. with a broad perspective right now we are just focusing how innovation or augmenting the learning skills or uh, through nep this session so sure. i'm i'm truly i'm not an expert on the nep i have not read the you know for it in the odd pages right yeah but i roughly know what it is uh, it's got very good intention Okay, so I'm I'm going to talk about some of the things in this area that I have been involved with, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So that's good. I think we've got around fifty-four attendees so far, fifty-five. Yeah, and it's also on YouTube. So yeah, so they might be on YouTube. Them. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. You've got around three minutes. We'll start exactly at six. Okay. Sure. Just keep the time, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I no, should sir. finish in thirty minutes. Yeah. Our sir is facing a little bit. Of, our second speaker, Professor Our sir, is facing a little bit of technical issues. So I pinged him. He said, "Yes, he is joining in minute." Sure. Yeah. So there is one thing that I wanted to ask you. Yeah. So, yes, ma'am. Uh, would you like to take questions right after your session or at the end when both the speakers have spoken? I think so that's either way, better, whichever right? you are comfortable. I think that's better, right? Or at the end after both the speakers no, but, have spoken. But if, but if the, the next speaker. Hmm, What do you suggest? Yeah, I can take it even after mine. Yeah, I'll just take it after because people will remember, right? <laughs> so, so you want to take it right after your session, right? Uh, let Let's. All right. It. Yeah. All right, sir. We'll do that. Sagar, you're on the big screen. Sagar, it's six. Shall we start? Ah, uh, yes, ma'am. Because uh, sir is facing a little bit Zoom issue. A minute. So we'll just wait for one minute. 
or we, i think we can start start it we'll start by the by the time he will join yeah, will that be okay sure okay all right because it's 6 o'clock i think we should start yeah okay <clears throat> good evening everybody welcome to the webinar on implementation of national education policy 2020 with a focus on innovation and skill development the national education policy 2020 outlines the vision of india's new education system the new policy replaces the previous national policy on education and it is a comprehensive framework for elementary education to higher education as well as vocational training in both rural and urban india the policy aims to transform india's education system to talk about the implementation of national education policy today we have our eminent speakers amongst us to begin with i would like to introduce our group director professor dr uday salunke sir professor dr uday salunke heads sp mandali's principal ellen wellinger institute of management development and research v school as its group director and edupreneur thought leader and a turnaround specialist dr salunke's passion for leadership design thinking innovation has helped wellinger carve a niche for itself in the space of management education he has extensive experience both in the academia and corporate world and is a recipient of several awards he has the distinction of being the recipient of the prestigious eisenhower fellowship usa which identifies empowers and links leaders across the globe empowering them further to make the much needed impact he is on board of many national and international organizations dr salunke currently is the chairperson of the review commission of the gujarat national law university chairman of the education committee of the council of eu chambers of commerce in india director of the board of society for mumbai incubation lab to entrepreneurship smile council the social entrepreneurship incubation of municipal corporation of greater mumbai formerly dr salunke has been the president of association uh, of management development institutions in south asia india chapter and he has been the president of association of indian management schools dr salunke strongly believes that the new education policy has paved the way for a transformed education system in india thereby ensuring an equal opportunity to all education seekers uh, dr salunke sir was expected to join us but due to some urgent exigencies he couldn't be here so with his blessings we will take the webinar forward now i would like to invite our first speaker for today professor ravi povaiya to share his views with us professor ravi povaiya is a senior faculty member at the industrial design center indian institute of technology bombay he also holds the dl shah chair for innovation at iit bombay he has backgrounds in mechanical engineering product design and graphic design education having studied respectively at indian institutes of technology at madras and bombay and the road island institute of design providence usa his research interests are in the areas related to visual language information visualization visual narratives interaction devices collaborative learning environments and designing play learn environments for children he is involved with building open spaces digital resources related to design learning folk tales designing for children design of wayfinding systems and design in india with access to network collaborative information in this regard he has been coordinating with the nid and iit guwahati a ministry of human resources sponsored project named ekalpa to build an open access digital learning environment for design in india he is also the coordinator of a research project on experimenting with social media called the center of social media innovators for Com communities cosmic a collaborative initiative between iit bombay and the universities from singapore nus and ntu cosmic aims to empower communities through social media innovations that improve the way they live work and play professor povaiya has worked on project with major industry leaders such as microsoft yahoo Google India, 
Motorola India, Indian Oil Corporation, Bharat Petroleum Corporation, Bharat Electronics Limited, Siemens India, among others. We welcome you, sir. But before I hand it over to Professor Povaya, I request all the participants to put their questions, if they have any, in the Q&A section, which sir will answer at the end of the session. Over to you, sir. We are eager to hear your views on the topic. Yeah, uh, thanks so much, uh, Priyanka Sharma. Okay, uh, very happy to be here. Thanks to Velinka Institute for inviting me for this session. Yeah, thanks to Sagar for you know connecting with me so many times. Right. Okay. So what I'll do is that I'll uh, share my screen uh, to show the slides. It's visible, right? Yes, sir. It's visible. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so, I'm going to talk on two things. Okay. First is uh, uh, the favorite subject of mine, design. I know Velikar also has a design focus. Uh, so, I'm going to talk about how academic transformations happened in the field of design. Uh, so, to, just to recollect back, uh, the world was... Uh, first and two triggered a lot of, uh, you know, rethinking, you know, and uh, and uh, that kind of uh, kind of forced people to redo, relook at many of the things. Okay, and uh, what I'm coming to say is that uh, now the COVID situation in many ways offers the same opportunities. You know, it's a time to reflect. Okay, it's a time to analyze. It's a time to rethink. Okay, and probably look ahead on what transformations we can do in terms of it, academics. Okay, uh, so so in this context, the NEP program kind of uh, is a very nice uh, uh, combination to go ahead with. Okay, so that's uh, that's uh, one part of my talk. The second part of my talk is that uh, I was very fortunate to be involved with uh, use of technology in education. So this is. A, a kind of journey of mine through through my times in uh, doing it and i'll show you instances where we have used it and the projects that we have done uh, because of that okay so i'll start with uh, uh, two influential people i think have been uh, very prominent in uh, uh, in thinking with respect to academics uh, first is john dewey okay so almost you know 100 years back now more than 100 years back uh, he uh, he was a very strong proponent of uh, democracy in education. What it actually means is that that the students need to have this freedom as an individual for the choice they make in terms of what they need to learn. Okay, which is a very strong statement coming uh, more than 120 years back. Okay, where uh, society actually determined that for you. Okay, the other person uh, is a common name. Uh, Maria Montessori, uh, who, who, whose Montessori, Montessori method of uh, learning is implemented in many schools around the world. Okay, she thought of this very interesting model that uh, children uh, have to do it and learn, you know, through an experiential means, and that leads to learning. You discover uh, things and that you learn about it. Okay, and these are uh, very strong. Uh, ideas uh, okay and how you adopt it is something that's up to us okay. so uh, as far as design learning is concerned i'm going to uh, look at three key issues uh, one is uh, how design is learned okay uh, what is learned in terms of design and where is it learned okay so so the three big questions were asked uh, almost 100 years back uh, in a school uh, which started uh, in Germany. And the person who en envisaged this is uh, Walter Gropius, an architect, a visionary. And uh, he was given this task of uh, running an art school and a craft school. And uh, he did something very interesting. He said that uh, instead of running two schools, if I can take the essence of both the things, you know, the art school essence and the craft school, which is based on skills, 
materials and I can put it together, maybe we have something which has not been done before, okay? And uh, that's how the, the concept of Bafos started. And uh, when he started it being an architect, okay, he also thought of a conducive environment for it. Okay, so he thought of, uh, of course, technology, glass and steel. So you had workshops with very large classes, which is at the far end. Uh, you had studios, he didn't call them classes, they were studios because you experimented and you learned what you want to do. Again, with large open windows and in between were the spaces where the faculty sat, okay? Or you could meet the faculty. In fact, they didn't even call themselves faculty, they called themselves tutors and learners. And the tall building towards the end is actually the hostel where the students and some of the faculty stayed in this place, okay? So, so the environment was something which was conceived to be very conducive to what you learn. Okay, so that's a, it's a very big takeoff. And of course, at this point of time, uh, the way in many fields uh, you learned was uh, being an apprentice. If you learn to learn medicine, you actually went and practiced with a doctor and learned the way he did, architect, the same thing, and uh, design also the same thing. Okay, so uh, Bajos uh, kind of turned it upside down. They said that let's give a challenge to the students and within boundaries and if they can explore and experiment and try it or make mistakes and learn, uh, that's the way they actually learn about things. Okay, so it was an individualized learning space that they were giving. And of course, uh, they gave them a whole lot of materials subjects to pick up from and uh, the students actually kind of weave their ways right through it. it it was a radically different way of looking at how learning happens okay so sir, I, sir, yeah. sorry uh, to interrupt but yeah. your voice is a little low so, voice is low is it so yes sir. how do i now how do i sound now little better sir but uh, could you be a little louder so uh, it, it's coming a little low Okay, let me just check the connection. Yeah, it seems to be connected. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. It's yes, much sir. better now, sir. Yeah. Better now? Okay. Yes, sir. Hope it stays that way. Yeah. Okay, so I'm, uh, to, you know, one of the faculty members here, Paul Klee, uh, he's an artist, uh, both Swiss and German. Okay, and uh, look at his statement. One eye sees, the other feels. Okay, so he's putting something which is rational uh, with something which is to do with feeling and emotions. Okay, combination of the two. And of course, he wrote books. He professed what he wanted to do. For example, he's talking about a visual element, which is a line. It's a dot that is going for a walk. It has emotions, it has expressions. Okay, so, so you brought in a lot of feeling to what you learned here. And then when you're building an object which had a linear structure, you would actually use some of these principles in your design. Of course, uh, uh, these faculty members, they practice what they preached. Okay, so what he did in the classes was something which he learned and made an output. Okay, so, so that was a very interesting combination. And uh, Walter Gropius uh, is the person standing on the right side. Okay, he brought in people from all around the world. Okay, he brought in Kandinsky here. He's a Russian painter into the school. And if you remember, it, it's a period of war. Okay, and uh, the first war, had just World War had just got over. So there was a lot of bloodshed, turmoil and all that. And uh, Kadinsky came from that and uh, he wanted to make a connection with uh, something which is spiritual. Okay, so his books reflected that, his works reflected that, and his paintings in many ways reflected that. You know, they were full of strength, anger, and you can see bloodshed in these paintings. Okay, so, so if you look at uh, the whole takeaway, you know, in terms of the school of Bajos, uh, it did transformation in terms of academics, which is the whole way of how a student learns. It also embraced not the past, but the future. It, it embraced the modernist movement, uh, which was something which was happening at that point of time. And industry had just come into place, right? So they said, our students are going to make things 
which the industry can produce. Okay, fantastic combination uh, of uh, takeaways. Okay, and if you look at what happened after that, okay, uh, people uh, looked at materials and process and uh, techniques in an entirely new way, and it came to be known as the Bauhaus philosophy. So this is steel and uh, canvas. Uh, this is fiberglass, uh, the kind of shapes that you can do, you can stack them up, you can produce it inside a factory. Uh, this is uh, plywood, bent plywood, formed plywood, okay, from uh, Japan. See, see, people started. The forms are very elegant, simple, nice. Uh, they look like they made just now, but they are so, so, like, this is almost now, you know, 90 years old, the Kaiser lamp and the cups by Massillon when you know, vanilla, right? So, so this is the philosophy that the school professed, okay? And uh, it was a boon to so many students. Of course, the war had its toll. The school closed down. Uh, but what it taught didn't close down. The faculty went to many places around the world. Uh, for example, the schools at MIT, Harvard, Yale, IIT Chicago. This is, these are the schools which came up... Uh, uh, with faculty members of Bajos coming and starting these schools, okay, and of course a whole lot of other schools in Europe came up. Okay, so the Bajos philosophy and the academic program and what they taught actually continued. Okay, one such school uh, which took this up after the war was the Ulm School. Okay, and again built totally on principles of. Uh, you know, having a conducive environment, beautiful, you know, spaces it created. And of course, if you look at it, design education towards systems thinking to attain a balance between science and design, between theory and practice. So, so they brought in design process. So if you go back into who are the pioneers of design thinking, you'll start uh, uh, from here. You know, this was a school which practiced the design process on how you can actually go ahead with the design. Okay, beautiful places. Uh, it was uh, by a graphic designer, Alter Escher, and Maxfield, the designer architect. Each and every thing inside the school was designed. You know, whether it's a desk or a switchboard or a light. Yeah, they took a lot of care in that. Okay, and if you look at their academic program, they embraced a whole lot of things. So if you want to become a designer, you need to be holistic. You need to connect with other fields. So you had philosophy, economics, sociology, politics, psychology, in addition to learning about uh, uh, the subjects, right? So you can see that uh, the faculty members work with the students. Okay, so that's Asher. And if you look at his output, that's the Munich identity and the symbols. That's a story for children. Uh, this is a corporate identity for Lufthansa, 120 years and still the same. <clears throat> okay, this is Maxfield in the class. Okay, always impressed with technology of what uh, things can do. Okay, he experimented with furniture, paintings, sculptures, forms, shapes, materials. Okay, and you can see that uh, wonderful, you know, you can see that they're all industrialized uh, joints. Okay, so you can see that uh, that's totally an industrial product. So the Ulm school brought in science into design. Okay, so again, a very interesting takeoff on academics. Okay, I have to mention this particular school, which came as an experimental school, Black Mountain College of uh, Design in North Carolina. Okay, and they took John Dewey's uh, principles of learning. Okay, so what they did was that they offered a totally interdisciplinary approach, but interestingly, it was so, so far-fetched that uh, there were no grades, there were no tests. The students can sit in any class, they can learn in any way. It was totally an immersive kind of thing. I mean, too early for that period. Okay, so, so they learned by being in that place. Okay, not by sitting in an exams and things like that. Okay, and uh, interestingly, they had a whole lot of things. They combined even the performing arts with other things and... Uh, they did it. And interestingly, they produced some of the best, you know, musicians and dancers and uh, people like that. Okay, so, so one needs to think back, you know, sometimes academics, you need uh, big transformations to uh, move, you know, 
uh, learning in some sense. Okay, so that's Black Mountain College in this side. Okay, so this is very close to uh, now. Okay, Singapore University of uh, Technology and Design, just 10 years old in Singapore uh, with collaboration with MIT. Uh, they've looked at a combination of technology and design in an, in an interesting way. Uh, they have the first three years as uh, foundation programs, okay, where you learn math, science, design, humanities, okay, and with this knowledge, you actually do the verticals, which could be architecture design, product design, system design, or information design. So again, so again, you have something entirely different way of looking at, uh, you know, taking academics forward, okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, Professor Natkani is very familiar to you. He is also my teacher, and uh, he uh, happened to study at Ulm School. So he brought in some of the aspects of Ulm School into uh, IDC at IIT Bombay, and you can see that uh, purity, precision, details. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's something which we imbibed in this school. Okay. So when IDC started, of course. Uh, you know, our country uh, needed development. So, so we thought of a holistic design education uh, that the students become, you know, very responsible fellow beings into, you know, contributing to us the society, especially the unmet needs of the society. Okay, so that's also, you know, aim and uh, motive in starting this code. But it also started with, uh, something which was an insight, uh, which was at that point of time, you know, uh, 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 we realized that, uh, you know, uh, students, uh, many students do their graduate program because their parents actually ask them to do it. It's not their first choice. They might have been actually quite, uh, you know, creative, uh, but uh, somehow they do this uh, graduation Okay, so let's see, we were looking for creative people. So we said that let's have a master program. Uh, the first semester probably is a foundation, but we have, we keep it open to engineers. And if you feel that they are creative enough, they can come into our program and graduate as designers. Okay, never done anywhere in the world, but uh, it was done at uh, IDC for the first time. And after a few years, realized that uh, the, these uh, students are potentially very get good at what they are doing and the model get replicated first of course in all the IITs but now it's a knock in the whole country you know any design school you go they take inputs of uh, the same structure okay very recently you know this is not very long time back you know we had the two batches of uh, our BDA students pass out again we have a we had a very good insight from the industry the industry was looking for uh, design graduates who had multidisciplinary skills. You know, they were not looking for one skills, but they wanted more than one skill. So they wanted them to be a product designer, at the same time, graphic designer, have knowledge of interaction design, and maybe able to animate some things, okay? So uh, this program was conceived like that. It's an integrated program. So all, all the buckets of design are taught such that when they finish four years, they have a fair understanding of all these fields. And of course, they can do the fifth year and they can specialize in a particular field. Okay, so you can see that from discovery to problem solving to building up the skills and implementing it and depth and specialization, that's how they, uh, they go forward. Okay, so this is uh, me, I think, uh, yeah, Priyanka read my bio. I did uh, go to IIT Metras to do mechanical engineering. Yeah, uh, IIT Metras, uh, many of them very good teachers, very structured, rigorous, you know, uh, very cognitive. Okay, uh, uh, you're evaluated throughout the semester, you they need to keep you busy. Okay, so that's the uh, IIT Metras uh, days for me. Okay, so, but when I came to IIT Bombay, it was a quite a different change, you know. Uh, suddenly the faculty members at uh, IDC were like friends. We were on first name basis. Uh, nobody called each other sir or anything like that. Okay, and uh, they showed us how to do it. They were like friends uh, showing us how to learn design, okay. and. Uh, Many of the things which are which are offshoots of uh, 
what we uh, seen before are something like this. We had design studios, we didn't have classrooms. Uh, studios were spaces, flexible spaces, uh, where you can, you can experiment, explore materials and uh, build prototypes and stuff like that. Okay, uh, we didn't have hourly classes, which I had got so used to at IIT Madras. Okay, we had week long modules. Okay, the subject would start on Monday and end on uh, Friday. And the learning was not based on textbooks. We didn't actually have a textbook. Okay, for, for I remember saying that, you know, uh, for if you want to be a designer, the library is your textbook. You know, because you need to learn about so many things that one text won't be, book won't be enough. So it was based on demonstrations, uh, looking at case studies and other examples. It was project-based learning. You actually took up a problem, you solved it in the process, you learned how to do it. You became better at it. You solved different kind of problems. It was totally an experiential learning. You do it and learn, make mistakes and learn. And you got involved in this whole process. Okay, so it was, you know, it was very emotional. I mean, we, we never left the classroom. In fact, the classroom became our bedrooms, actually, if you remember that, right? Okay, so, so that was a drastic transformation in terms of the learning that I had to do when I came to uh, IDC. And uh, it still goes on like that. Okay, so at this point of time, you know, uh, I was also looking at learning other medias and one such media that I happened to learn was uh, video. This in fact, uh, at, uh, at uh, Rhode Island School of Design, I took it as an elective and learned video. And uh, my intention was very clear that uh, video not for entertainment, uh, not for just artistic exploration, but uh, use video for learning content okay so we use the principles of uh, you know storytelling play and learn creating you know exciting content okay students did many projects in this area this started in 1984 uh, started with vhs then umatic then beta and then digital yeah that's the way it went about of course the desktops came in the 80s okay so we need to play with the interactive learning so we had hypercard and uh, such programs doing it okay and then an opportunity came because we had set up the audiovisual lab at idc and uh, we were experimenting with video and we said that can we not scale this up uh, for the whole institute because uh, video has large implications for learning so we set up the education technology cell which is a service uh, unit for the whole institute Okay, so I'm giving you one very simple example. Okay, uh, so when faculty members are recruited to IIT, they're recruited not because of their teaching ability, but because of their research uh, ability. Okay, they don't even test whether this person can actually teach or not. Okay, so the most of the faculty members have learned how to teach after they come to IIT, right? So one of the things we offered as a service was. Uh, you know, we will come and record your 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 talk or your your class, okay? And uh, give this recording back to you. This is 1990, okay? VHS tapes, so you can take it back, and we give them a player. So he actually looks at it, and he realizes the kind of things he's doing wrong, okay? If he needs help, he used to help offer services and communications, okay? And so that he can improve the way he actually. Uh, does his uh, lectures to the students, okay? And uh, many, many faculty members came and did that, okay? And that led to another uh, aspect of it. We said that let's record the, uh, the lectures in the classroom. At that point of time, our intention was that some of the students who are sick and who miss the classes, if I can actually make use of these videos, uh, keep it in the library and make a room for it, Okay, they can actually go and watch it. Uh, to our surprise, uh, these videos of uh, lectures got used so much. And uh, we also realized that uh, many students are actually coming to look at it for the second time or the third time because it became a, a way of rehearsing and uh, listening to the same lecture itself. Okay. And uh, of course, uh, elsewhere also, these experiments were 
uh, having the same kind of results. Uh, it's not totally a system for learning, but it's an augmentative system for learning. Okay, uh, we also experimented with video conferencing. A workshop was held across the metros. Uh, of course, we didn't have the bandwidth, so we had to go to the VSNL for the video conferencing facility. We did it and we felt that the outputs were really good, though people were separated by quite a distance, uh, but it was quite a successful, uh, you know, collaboration. So then we decided that uh, at least let's collaborate between IITs to exchange the best practices. Uh, for example, in the classroom, we realized that it's not so nice to put a camera and, uh, you know, record a faculty member teaching because his back is to you because he's writing on the on the wall so we we turned it into a camera which is mounted on the ceiling okay so you can write on a piece of paper and what he's writing is projected on a screen so you get what he's trying to write you capture it on the camera you have another ca camera capturing his face okay so that combination became a quite a nice way to make videos okay so in 1998 uh, professor paul goodman yeah, it's from the Tepper School of Business in uh, Carnegie Mellon University. He invited uh, many, uh, mostly directors and decision makers from IITs and IIMs to just to show what they are doing. Okay, so it was very interesting. Uh, they were actually advisors to uh, both Mexico and Argentina in actually uh, having an open forum for learning. And what they had done was that because of a shortage of teachers in these two countries, uh, they had done the whole thing through either uh, through video exchange or through transmission. So you had sub centers where you had facilitators, okay? And uh, there was a large number of uh, students undertaking these courses and they were being done online, okay? so. That made a lot of sense uh, at that point of time, even for a country like us, because uh, that's uh, probably one of the ways that you can go into open learning methods. Okay, uh, the other example which we saw was also very very interesting by Professor Shamsun. The, he's now at Yale, not at uh, CMU. Uh, he had a, a virtual stock trading. He built this a uh, platform, and he ran the whole whole course for a semester where the student had to start an industry and they had to trade in stocks and invest and they learned about the whole thing virtually okay and for me uh, you know it was an eye opener at that point of time okay so uh, two big takeaways from this uh, place and uh, what really happened was that uh, that uh, we all sat together and said that uh, we'll put forward a proposal on creating a virtual center, we, center for technology enhanced learning, uh, which will offer online courses and things like that. Okay, so this is uh, around 2002, and uh, we made this proposal to, to the ministry. Okay, at that point of time, all the IITs were together as well as the IIMs, uh, along with Carnegie Mellon University. Okay. Uh, good things happen. Okay, so uh, our proposal got accepted. Okay, so instead of calling it VCTL, uh, we called it as National Program for Technology Enhanced Learning. It was called as NPTEL. Uh, we all joined together. The first phase, uh, 265 courses were developed by, it was mainly the IITs. It was called as the phase one. Okay, and uh, they sanctioned the phase two part of it, which went on till 2014, 600 more courses were added to this. These were documentation of faculty members giving their lectures mainly. Okay, and some were lab experiments and some were, uh, you know, additionally added some animation and made the content a little better, but typically they were just recordings of the, of the lectures, okay. And uh, now, uh, you know, in uh, later on, after 2015, they created a platform called as the Swayam. Uh, uh, and uh, through offering some of the MOOC program, you can actually go and learn these programs. They're offered uh, on a semester basis. Uh, there is a whole lot of courses being done. Okay, so, so the NPTEL now, uh, whatever resource we have, feeds into the Swayam program. Okay, so, 
if you look at it, I mean, uh, some of the things are really uh, big takeaways. Okay, it's, it's the largest online repository in the world of courses in engineering, basic sciences and humanities. Okay, it's also the most accessed library of peer reviewed educational content. Okay, and uh, out of this 51,000 hours have subtitled videos. Okay, so it's being used by billions of uh, students here. Yeah, so that's one of the things. Okay, and uh, the ministry also decided to do something else, which is interesting. In fact, uh, at that point of time, they said we'll put uh, 500 channels just dedicated for education. Uh, now 34 are running. Okay, they telecast some of these programs online. It's repeated uh, every four hours every day. Uh, the schedule is online, so you can do it. And yeah, you can access it anytime. Okay, so that's the Swayam Prabha program, uh, which is there. Uh, from my own side, right? How, how am I doing on time? Okay. Okay, so this okay, is. Okay, sir. Yeah, it's okay, right? Okay, so this is the last bit. Uh, this is a project which we did uh, 10 years back. Uh, so we went to the ministry. Ministry was very open to ideas, and uh, yeah, they were supporting. We said that we need to do something for online learning of design. Uh, so we said we'll create a digital learning environment for design focused on India. Okay, so we did that. It's very India centric. Uh, so we also joined hands uh, with other institutes, uh, IIT Guwahati, NID. Yeah, so we all put together. We did a. Uh, you know this project okay and uh, we put content online okay so it's open access so we have courses on design we have resources which students need to use uh, lots of case studies there are galleries that one can do there are tools which serve as studios or labs okay of course you can look at videos it can be accessed on mobiles or tablets and uh, we either take crowdsourced content now or experts contribute it on a on a, on an ongoing basis. Yeah, it has formed a network. So right now, if you look at it, there are about 120 courses, 750 resources. There are case studies, there are galleries, there are videos, there are tools that one can use. Uh, I'll uh, have a peek into some of them. Uh, this is a course on virtual reality. Both students and faculty members use it. Okay, it uh, you know talks about the content, but it also says the kind of exercises one needs to do to learn uh, VR. Uh, similarly, this is a this is a tool uh, where you can actually immersively learn color. Okay, interactively learn color. It can be used as a lab. Uh, you can go step by step. A faculty member can mentor to use this, or you can do it individually. Uh, but all the color theories uh, and the uh, applications of color are explained in this uh, tool. Uh, so we call it a tool to learn design. Uh, case studies. Uh, this is uh, if you go through these case studies, you'll you realize what are the design process and the steps involved in designing the rupee symbol, for example. Yeah, or uh, have information on things which are. Uh, you know, which are India-based, like all the traditional toys are documented here. Yeah, the cognitive toys, physical toys, sensory toys, social toys, okay, or uh, a puzzle, for example, yeah, or uh, or a communicator. This is a communicator for people and children uh, who cannot speak and they want to communicate and learn. So we develop a tool for it. Okay, so in some sense, uh, these are my you know, touch with technology. Uh, DSOS also runs competitions. These are design competitions where you have to use design process. You have to make use of DSOS as a resource and then come out with uh, solutions. Uh, we, we did several rounds of competitions because it was the COVID time. Yeah. Okay, so uh, that's my journey. Okay, and now we are doing this. Okay, COVID has come in. Okay, so we need to, we are forced to go online. Uh, we are almost now two and a half semester down the line. Okay, and uh, initially we had a lot of apprehensions, doubtful whether this would be possible. Uh, 
but it seems to be we are going fine you know with all the teaching problems uh, we're still doing quite okay you know uh, our students have finished almost two and a half semesters now okay so this is out of the feedback i put it together uh, the negatives first one thinks of the negatives of course you don't have the school you can't go to a place where you interact with each other you know it is not just physical it's also social uh, it's a total mess yeah because of this of course yeah, you know you need good facilities you get to uh, need good labs and workshops uh, uh, there's a limit to what you can do at home uh, so these i feel you know as as uh, one of the toughest negatives of course in india you have problems of uh, connectivity and several other issues uh, but over a period of time let's say we overcome that okay these two would be still the negatives okay but you look at the positives okay students are at their home located we don't know where they are all around the place yeah and uh, typically iit gets uh, its students from all over the country you know from small villages to big towns yeah so th that's a wonderful thing right you are able to connect with students uh, uh, for a large space uh, next, I realized is that uh, we have many projects where students work together as groups and they have done wonderfully. You know, I st we still have to figure out what is the reason that has happened, but the outputs are far superior to what they were doing uh, when they were physically present in, in the classroom. You know, uh, it's a lot more detailed, uh, there's a lot more depth in it, there's a lot more involvement in it. Okay, so so I think this is something which which actually works out quite well because they do it at their own time and space, okay, which is a big advantage rather than coming to a place to do it in that given space, okay. And the outcome of this is really something which uh, I didn't expect. You know, for me, you know, documenting the course was such a big effort in the physical domain. You know asking them to upload into servers, this, that, and all that. Now this is happening automatically. I have wonderful documentation for all the courses that I've done. You know, I have the references, I have the student outputs, I have the tasks, I have videos of the presentations, of the discussions. Okay, and uh, this is a priceless collection and it's happening without any effort. Okay, didn't think of it, but yes, but for me, you know, I think opportunities are there. We need to look ahead. Okay, it's been always like that. Okay, so if you look at uh, history, you know, almost 30,000 years uh, is when man uh, used his skills, the human skills to draw and to make objects, right? And uh, it was almost 10,000 10, years back that uh, he figured out agriculture. Okay, and his strength became something that you can use uh, so you could go and conquer yeah so human strength was very very important that uh, you know almost thousand years back okay and uh, just 500 years back is when we started our sciences and technology and knowledge became very very important yeah we are still in this phase and if you kind of look at where we are heading towards right of course, creativity is always there, but it looks like creativity is at a premium now. Okay, uh, innovation and entrepreneurship is something that is, you know, that is very much needed now. You know, how do we do that? So, I'm sure I'm talking about education institutes, and I think COVID is a good time to think ahead. Okay, it's a wonderful opportunity. If you can't think ahead now, you'll never do it. And I think all of us can do innovations at our own level. And uh, this is a very opportune moment. Okay. So I'm just giving you clues. Okay. V school, you can locate V school anywhere in the world. Okay. You can go to wonderful locations, even within the country, go to a hill station or a seashore, have it in a place which is, you know, environmentally friendly. You don't have to dump it in the middle of a city anymore. Okay, because students can come once in a while to the school, right? You can be located and you can get faculty from anywhere. Okay, so this is a paradigm shift. Okay, and uh, yeah, and I think we need to embrace what is going to happen in the future in this. You look at schedules. 
okay uh, schools have very fixed schedules you know we have the timetable you have to come to this class at this point of time and i think that gets totally broken now right you can learn at any point of time you can learn at your own pace right so we need to relook at uh, what scheduling means uh, that has a lot of implications okay of course synchronous ones need schedule but asynchronous doesn't need a schedule and you can learn a lot of things at asynchronous okay and look at collaboration okay because you can collaborate with industry with peers uh, with people located in different places that's something which can happen so spontaneously and so easy to do it uh, just like this uh, webinar we are doing it's so easy to get everybody together you know in their own space you could be having your dinner you can have your tea yeah but still yeah so it it, it is something which uh, which is enabled okay and of course this we said okay so whatever you do becomes a resource for the future and properly that becomes your library in the future okay so i'm going to stop at this point of time i think uh, my point is that that uh, it's a very good time to think ahead okay yeah thanks so much Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for sharing your insights with us. Uh, we actually came to know some very interesting facts that you've done at IDC. Very, very, uh, very, very revealing and very, very entertaining also at the same time. Okay. So, uh, yeah, uh, so I've got around uh, some few questions here that uh, uh, the participants would like to ask you. So sure. maybe we have uh, time for around two or three questions. So um, I'll just read it out. Uh, for you. Uh, the first question is, is it possible for rural students with existing e-learning platforms such as Deeksha, Swayam and Swayam Prabha to have equal access to quality, practical and hands-on experiment-based learning experiences? Yeah, so you need to relook at it. Okay. Uh, of course, learning in terms of content, listening to talks is possible. If you have fairly a good connection, you can do that. You can also download and watch it, right? Uh, but if you want to do hands-on, uh, you have to do, I mean, we also need to get geared up, okay? So there are limitations to this, but of course, uh, you can do something which is, which is uh, that you can do inside a home that you can buy from your local, uh, you know, shops and things like that. Okay, so there are a lot of lot of things, experiments that you can do with local materials and processes. Okay, but there is a uh, there's a good side to it. Okay, uh, this is uh, something which the ministry is thinking of doing it. Okay, in the future, it, it's kind of. Uh, I mean, you don't have to say it. I think it's an essential part. Just like you have a post office in your locality, right? You need to have a learning center in your locality. Okay, right. yeah. So, so that that becomes the space for your lab. Okay, it could be located in the next town or next district headquarters, but we need to make it accessible to everybody. Okay, if that program when it comes through, I think that accessibility problem will get solved. Okay, till then, I think we have to make like like we we were teaching design this semester, right? And uh, typically they learn uh, to use materials. Uh, so they had to invent, you know, what are the materials that you can get at home? It's paper, cardboard, you know, uh, things like that, right? So, so you had to reinvent your exercises to, to suit that process, okay? So I think the same thing happens here also. But I'm guessing that once the learning centers come, hopefully so, uh, that's something to look forward to, yeah? All right. So there's one more question. Uh, um, so there's a comment for you, which says, dear sir, nice session. And uh, the question is, what are the limitations in teaching design related subjects online? That's a difficult one. Uh, so so uh, see where the students do their design process, there's absolutely no problem. Okay. Uh, it's only at the prototyping stage that you have some difficulty. Okay. But design, you know, it, it has, you know, many parts of design are digital. If, you, if you're an interaction designer, your outputs are digital. If you're a communication designer, mostly it's, uh, it's digital, right? 
only if you're a product designer that you need to actually think of the physical product, okay? But uh, if you look at the, all the stages of the design, from user research to, to analysis, to creative problem solving, to, you know, soft prototyping it, you can do it online. It's only the hard prototype that you can, can't actually do, okay? So again, uh, there are silver sides to things, okay? So uh, we don't have that many services, just like you get things off from Amazon. Uh, virtually, if you can actually uh, download your program and make a you know rapid prototyping model out of it, get it shipped to your home, there's no way, I mean, that could probably can happen, but these services are not yet there. But if you look at uh, what people are thinking about, maybe that's something uh, like a service that you offer in the future. Okay, so then I think it's possible to do it. Okay, but of course, I think what, uh, what everybody says is that there's one point of time where, you know, if you're next to the object that you're producing and making a presentation, that's, that's a lot different from a virtual presentation of it. Yeah, even in terms of feedback. Yeah, but I have a feeling because we've already done now two and a half semesters, right? And uh, with all the limitations, the learnings have been good. It's not like you know the learning was uh, so high when we were doing it physically, and it's so low now. Okay, we are able to not really you know the kind of presentations we've had for the projects. We've seen that uh, the quality actually has not gone down and many times the quality impact has gone up because they're sitting at home, they have all the time in the world, you know, they are spending a lot more time and effort in solving these problems. Okay, that's getting reflected in their projects. And if you're socially active, I guess you have a lot of other things to do in addition to learning, right? Right. I think we have uh, time for just one more question and it's actually very related to what we are talking about right now. So this question says uh, during the pandemic, uh, the entire teaching learning experience has changed for the students. So right. would you have any suggestions on how we can use uh, design thinking to, in, uh, to improve this uh, teaching learning experience? Oh, that's a tough question yeah, because design thinking means you need to think, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, you have to apply the design process to this, uh, but I think the last few slides were indicative of that. You know, I'm saying that it's actually a good time to rethink on the way you learn. Okay, there, there, there has been many plus points which, uh, which uh, the COVID situation has brought in. Okay, <clears throat> and I think we need to look at it as something which is going to be a norm in the future. Okay, uh, we probably will get back to you know, physical interactions, but the virtual interactions also probably are there to stay. Okay. Yeah, of course, uh, yeah, you can apply design thinking to anything. We you know, love doing it. And I think if you can apply that to what has happened now, I'm sure you'll find uh, wonderful solutions to, to this kind of situation. Uh, or at least if you can think of uh, what's going to be academics in the future, uh, that's something which design thinking can actually help you do it. Yeah, confident of that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, sir. There are other questions also flowing in. Uh, maybe uh, we can uh, address them offline, maybe because we only have time for so many uh, today. So thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for taking the time out and being with us and sharing your insights with us. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Uh, please stay with us. The other speaker is also about to come. Yeah, sure, sure. I'll, I'll, yeah. Thank uh, you so much. So now I hand it over to Professor Sagar to take over and introduce the next speaker, please. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, our next speaker is Professor Dr. Rawal Awale, sir. He's a senior electronics professor from VJTI with 30 years of experience in specialization in signal and image processing. Professor Awale is an expert evaluator for NBA. He also handled TQ projects funded by World Bank since 2006, currently in third phase is on. And under his leadership, Vijaya stood one of the top institute in terms of academic excellence in TQ evaluation carried by independent evaluate nationwide. I request Dr. Aulis sir to please take over and share his thought national education policy. Over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sagar. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. You're audible. Yeah. 
just one second yeah <clears throat> Screen is visible, no? Yes, sir. Screen is visible. Pretty yeah. clear. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for nice introduction, which is looking towards me. I'm not that great. Definitely, I will thank, and it is indeed pleasure for me to be a part of this particular program, wherein definitely I come across very nice session by Professor Ravi. Thank you, Professor, for giving this opportunity and enlightening me as well. The topic told was NAP 2020. And I believe whatever Professor Ravi has gone through, it is exactly the sort of case study which is expected in NAP 2020. So, Professor, you have given the pathway as well to this forum. What this NEP is and what are expected. So thank you for that as well. Uh, as given the task that I have to speak on NEP, so definitely the collected material I have put it on slides and I'm here to give you the ins and out to you people regarding NEP 2020. Let us move further. So basically, what is need of NAP or such a policy of national education policy? So friends, you know that India is largest democracy, approximately approaching and there about 138 crores population. And if you see our average age is less than 20. So huge young manpower available in the country. But if you look towards our cross enrollment ratio, it is also less than 30%. So it is too less compared to developed countries. And it is indicative that most of our youth is not coming towards the organization, towards the institute, towards the schools. Basically. That is one aspect. Another is, if we look towards the employment ratio or employability of our graduates. The India Skill Report, ISR published in 2021, is indicative. It says that almost 45.9% graduates are employable. And if you see that percentage, it is declining over the years. Indicative figures are here. In 2019, it was 47.38, and in 2020, it was 46.38. So obviously, if we look towards the employability or employability of our graduates, depending on their key parameters, which has been tested, there is big question marks on the skill of our graduates as well. And definitely due to unavailability of skills of their own domain, their employability is not so good. As far as the reason for this poor employability or uh, knowledge of our graduates is concerned, there are so many aspects as such. It's not only one or other or singular thing is responsible for that. It indicates poor foundation as whatever primary education they are going through, it's degrees altogether. And everybody is looking for marks, marks and marks or grades, grades and grades. Rather, the conceptualization or concept of learning remains on second stage. Admission process and procedures as well are also responsible for that. Even the curriculum offered to our graduates is having hand in developing such poor graduates. Because if you look towards, so many universities are there in India and they are offering the courses which are at all not in sync with today's requirement. Industry is moving towards 
4.0 and they are teaching all traditional things which are not in existence nowadays as well but it is not in the hands of individual faculty and all even though we know that then also we can't do anything because machinery which is operating in the university system is having tremendous lethargy and not responsive in many cases even the quality of teaching is responsible for that the teachers who are coming there they are coming as a service or job not as a profession so that is also the responsible nowadays even the interest of student is lacking in that most of the things and in addition even our corporates they are not showing so much interest in teaching learning process of academic sciences but nowadays things are changing as well i'm not cursing all these things it is indicative that these are the things with which that skills acquirement or skill acquired by our graduates are getting impressed upon so looking for all these things it is necessity that immediately this gap should be identified quantified and definitely some short term as well as long term policies need to be finalized because if it will prolong further definitely it will be problematic on long run for the country like india so friends with this objective government of india has formulated the committee under chairmanship of honorable dr k kasturi rangan most of you might be knowing him by name or might have opportunity to interact with him personally as well an eminent scientist and ex chairman of isro they have worked alone and submitted the report in 2009 to the government just uh, on left hand side i put one indicative picture of our education system and beneath the quotation from albert einstein so you can see there that class is there and faculty like us is sitting and evaluating the students so this picture is self indicative which indicates that i evaluate the student depending on my capability and my know how rather than looking towards their skills or their qualities and that's why our whole system is leading towards turmoil and the figures or the KPIs are indicative of all this. So, Dr. Kasturi Rangan has, along with his team, formulated the report and submitted to the government as a long-term basis for as a solution to these problems. And after deliberation, that report was approved by the committee on 29 July 2020 and accepted for implementation. that is our national education policy is presented friends let us move further and more into more deep of nep so this nep 2020 it is first education policy of 21st century and trends almost earlier policy was in peak was in implementation since 1986 as national policy of education the policy nep 2020 which has been proposed here is complete universalization of education from pre school to graduation and post graduation or to higher education level up the more focus was to enhance the gross enrollment ratio which was there in 2018 was 26.3% the target for 2025 was enhancement by 50% in this 26.3 and by 2025 
government is expecting that it will be double than whatever there in 2020 as far as uh, out of school children are there the target is of 2 crore this policy envisage that implementation of this will bring back this dropout of that you know to crores to the organizations to the institute to the school and it will give the opportunity to add on 3.5 crore new seats in existing higher education institutions. so all these things in a nutshell is the aims or targets decided by this new education policy friends let us move further so this policy decided some expected outcomes with uh, milestones as well and these milestones are devised after every five years like implementation from 2020 so 25 30 35 and 2014 it is expected that this complete national education policy will be implemented in all respects so this is span or time span for initial implementation to the final amalgamation of this national education policy expected outcomes after implementation i have listed some for your information first is universalization of access that means from preschool to graduation as well the access should be multifaceted and uh, multiple ways of entry and exit should be made available to the students equity and inclusion so there should not be any bifurcation on the basis of caste creed region economic status and all as listed earlier almost two crore targeted student should be bring back to the institutes to the school this policies align towards the sdg goals given by united nations it improves the quality and achievement of learning outcomes that means everybody should have foundational literacy as well as numerary knowledge mentioned as FLN. This policy focus on skills which are required in 21st century. And even you might be knowing that our regulator, AICT, has come out with the big list, skill list, and made it mandatory as well to acquire these skills in all our graduates. I'm talking regarding professional graduates. But this policy is extending the skills to all sorts of education, including primary education as well. Resource sharing, wherein the complexes, school complexes are taken into consideration and handshaking amongst these con uh, complexes shares the knowledge sharing and best practices. Effective governance, wherein separate Powers has been extended to the institutes, to the government governing bodies, but the governance plan will be common across the country. The major outcome of this will be this policy focuses that learning should be in own languages or in mother tongue. If it is creating barrier or if other language creating that, if you are conversant, definitely you can use it. But moreover, giving preferences to the mother tongues or the languages which are conversant from childhood, the focus is more on that. And there will be some standards set for the schools which they have to adhere with and depart the quality knowledge or quality education. To the population. So, with this outcomes, 
this NAP altogether is roaming around or framed around. Here we can see left hand side there is picture wherein the committee in chairmanship of Dr. Kasturi Rangan is submitting their report to Honorable Minister. As far as this report is concerned, on the right side, you can see the cover page of that report as well. This report altogether consists of 27 chapters, wherein the first eight chapters are for school education, the changes, modifications, implementation policies and all for school education. Then another section is from nine, chapter 9 to 19, which is dealing with higher education. Chapter 20 to 24 talks regarding some key areas and focus of that NEP. And last three chapters are talking regarding implementation and challenges in making it happen. So this is all together the report submitted by the committee having 27 chapters and giving ins and out regarding the thought process they have proposed for revamping of our total education system since 2020 onwards. So friends, this particular report has been aligned across sustainable development goals declared by United States. And basically, it is majorly concentrating on goal four, which is quality education, and goal 10, reduced inequalities. That is the major focus. Along with that, all this like clean climate and all, or energy, or energy sustenance, it is aligning up to some extent as well. So majority of SDGs are considered while considering or framing this policy altogether. And with this NAP, India or all of us are aspiring to bring back the old Indian glory of education to the current education. So, let us begin with transforming curriculum and pedagogy structures, which is related to primary education. On left hand side, you can see existing structure wherein we have gone through. So you can see the blue box in that existing structure, which is up to age six, wherein there is disparities that people will go to school some are roaming in the field, some are working for their bread and butter. Well-to-do people goes into play groups, KG1, LKG, UKG and all. So till age six, definitely there is disparity in the education departed to all of the country. After that, there is structured classes from class one to class 10. So average age from six to 16, student can complete this particular 10 years. And there is board examination, SSC board. There are different boards as well. After that, again, additional two years of 12. So we are in the system of 10 plus two. Now, the structure has been a little bit changed and now modified to 5 plus, 3 plus, 3 plus 4. Wherein, once candidate attend the age of 3 years, the student or the boy or kid will be admitted to Anganwadi or preschool or Balwatika. And there, till age of 6, he will have this foundational stage or his foundations shall be laid down. Now, what does this foundation be? 
that foundation will be activity based foundation wherein he or she will learn through interactions through plays through games by doing things himself or herself because whenever you do these activities you can learn more and more by observing by doing this so that basic philosophy has been imbibed in that foundational stage after 6 six, 6 six to 8 this two years student will do class 1 and class 2 so average age remains almost same but in that particular year the basic foundation the curiosity in the candidate or its zeal towards learning innovating new things that logical thinking and curiosity has been created in the candidate during this foundation after the age of 8 it will be transferred to the second stage which is called as preparatory stage there as well it will not be focus on just going through the themes books and acquiring the marks there as well different modules have been provided to them wherein through different activities they try to learn there will be more interaction amongst faculty and student or rather faculty remains amongst the student and explore the things or support the student to explore the things or learn them. at the stage of middle stage or middle age that will be from class 6 to class 8 more focus should shall be towards experience experiential learning student will do experiments on their own they will evolve with some methodologies as well new methodology which is expected and they gain the knowledge or experience the knowledge and after that there will be secondary stage from class 9 to class 12 wherein it will be multi disciplinary more critical thinking as well as innovation as well as curiosity will be imbibed in the country so that way nowadays as everybody or employers are saying that students don't have skill student don't have logical thinking student can't think beyond the domain and all that may get them. so likewise that new bit change is introduced in the system through implementation of this and the major focus of this particular model is towards the fundamental or foundation stage wherein it is expected that every student or every candidate in india either he or she will be rich or poor or anything should get bare minimum educational facilities and their grooming should be on village and that's why this early ch- child care education policy has been implemented in nec nec which is divided into two parts first part is 3 to 6 which is early child care foundation and another is 6 to 8 class 1 and class 2 wherein till 3 to 6 there will be major focus on making this candidate comfortable creating values in it and all after that he or she will be pass on to class 1 and class 2 very in as well the multiple layer different activities will create the inclusiveness in the candidate and the overall progressive growth will be assured for all the population of them in this particular initiative jointly hrd now it's minister ministry of education women and child development health and family welfare and tribal affairs will jointly concentrate on it and make this package or make this particular curriculum so 
enjoyable so that every student or every boy or girl will come towards the school and enjoy that literacy another aspect of this nep is universal access to the education at all levels wherein you can see this wheel uh, having different facets these facets are learning outcome that means every learn learning opportunity will have some outcomes defined in concrete way and always against that outcomes the progress has been evaluated nowadays as well just now we are starting this obe methodologies outcome based education in different uh, streams no doubt still we are not so conversant but we are gearing up towards the challenges of this obe as well and definitely nep will be supportive to this initiative for this lear uh, defined learning outcomes government emphasize upon different organizations as well to build different schools or make the facilities available to the school going kids nowadays like there will be path and differentiation against different branches likewise the path for this particular education will be multifaceted wherein various input output or in and exit facilities will be provided so that there should not be school dropouts at all even if there will be dropouts there will be facility to bring the dropout to the school nowadays this learning happens in the schools in concise classrooms and and, and all with different facilities but definitely with implementation of nep nep alternative center different centers will be evolved not as a school and this education will happen at different locations at different background and with different tutors as well and this policy will focus on peer tutoring rather than just one way tutoring tutoring and all so likewise its combination of all these facts which provides the ability to give multifaceted education to our population or to our budding generation here the focus will be the four aspects are majorly focused for by nep that is it should not be the overburden on the candidate so teach only core essential knowledge to the candidate try to develop the student holistically with critical thinking and ability to think and generate something classes should not be like open the book and uh, read it from there and all or it should not be monologue the classes should be interactive classes and more over the total learning should be experiential learning through different activities through making fun plays games and all so that way student should feel that they are doing activities rather than feeling that they are learning the things and the target for adopting this is for that pedagogy transformation the target decided was 2022 so it is expected that till 2022 the structures will come forward therein all these four key parameters will taken into consideration the basic initiative is revision of ncf national curriculum framework which has been given for school education as well as teachers education for teachers training in 2009 the major way this ncfs need to be reframed or revision is going and definitely before 2021 let us hope so 
that this particular revision will be in front of us and our kids will enjoy the envisaged impact of any NEP 2020. Major focus of this learning outcomes shall be on competency-based education, integration of subjects, development of scientific temper, silos will be removed, like your science, your art, your commerce and all, it will be combined learning. Major emphasis on digital literacy and multilingual teaching shall be adhered or promoted. Madam, how much time I will get after that? Yes, Agar. So you have five to ten minutes, sir. Yeah, so I have to wind it up. Actually. Yeah, sure. Yeah, fine. So focus outcomes are there. Then this ninth and twelve, which are supposed to be boards, the exam reformations are also planned, wherein the easier mode has been given for evaluation. The mode of evaluation, multiple modes will be adopted and it will be made enjoyable for the students. But no doubt, different standards and norms and regulators will be there who will see the implementation, whether it is properly implemented or not. Standard setting and accreditation mechanism will definitely will be developed and look after the quality of education departed by this government organization as well as the organization set by private players. Also. This is regarding the primary education. Now switch to higher education. Basically higher education, it is broad based. There will be multidisciplinary education that is universities and colleges. Every district, there should be at least one university and education will be in local languages. Holistic education will be departed with flexibility, let it, having different streams of education and multiple entry and exit point will be provided. An academic bank of credits will be provided wherein I can acquire the credits and once I get 180 or 200 credits, I can say I'm eligible for the degree. Multidisciplinary research universities will be there. National Research Foundation will form, which will basically regulate us to foster the research culture in the country. Some benefits will be extended to this NEPs, like full autonomy will be given to the faculty. Curriculum, pedagogy, assessment, all will be in faculty's hands and revamping will be simpler. In turn, it is expected that student will experience the enhanced learning and skill can be adopted by the student. Institute leadership will be purely on merit basis. There should be career progressions depending on teaching, research and services departed to the society. Improved governance will be there with independent BOG. Still, there will be light but tight regulator with regulation with single regulator and increased access, equity and inclusion will be envisaged in any pitfall. Institutes will be restructured. There will be not institutes. Now there will be research intensive universities and teaching intensive universities. So this institute or universities has to select the tracks like either research orientation or teaching orientation. All these facilities will be extended to the organizations, becoming higher engineering uh, education institute, multidisciplinary universities in time to come. And target is till 2030. There should be curriculum, national curriculum framework for teachers education which develops our two teachers. 
substandard organizations will be penalized till closing the organizations as well and national mission of mentoring should be involved the senior people full of them will be there to monitor and mentor the new universities and colleges there will be policy for attracting best faculty in higher engineering institutes as well some are listed down here overall environment will be multidisciplinary well is in imaginative and flexible curriculum will be there with all these departments and having flexibility to select any of the things as per requirement and as per wish of the student so really choice based curriculum higher education institute should have will have mandatory arts and cultural department innovative curriculum with credit based courses and projects will be there and projects specifically related to community environment and value based education frequent surveys will be there to see and create the awareness opportunity of internship will be embedded in, in curriculum itself so that hands on experience will be there in the student and types will different organizations locally and globally will be expected from such institutes as well focus will be on research and innovation of ndp which will strengthen the make in india initiative institute have mandatorily the tie ups with or linked with at least one msme multiple opportunities in different fields to clubs counseling system should be in place that will be mandatory requirement and there should be additional support to the student from rural background equity and inclusion will be integral part of this particular system wherein the discrimination shall be eliminated towards socially and economically disadvantaged groups major focus should be on vocational education and everywhere including from secondary education or primary education there will be inclusion of skills as a vocational vocational skills as a mandatory part. provision of scholarships will be there so that no one should be deprived of education for want of money distance learning as well will be integral part or uh, blended learning shall be there wherever it is not possible definitely that repositories of digital courses will be there as professor ravi has suggested that they have used in those days now as well this nep is ex expecting same thing on a enhanced way and always wherever not, not possible this digital online learning or distant learning will be will be uh, recommended internalization internationalization of education is also expectation of nep wherein mous be top 100 universities from the world faculty and student exchange exchange then opening the campuses in the country by top world rank universities and all will be embodied in the policies altogether so that the population of country will get world class education no doubt everywhere there will be a regulatory framework which will monitor for all the quality and its implementation professional education has been enhanced through clusters till 2030 adult education will be included in the curriculum language arts and culture will be promoted basically this nep proposes and enhances towards the use of technology for 
teaching learning where in all these diksha swayam and all platforms along with disruptive technologies ai machine learning and natural processing and all will be there shall be considered at national level by national education technology forum use of technology in regulation of this higher education institute will also be there by online portals and all where iict is doing currently strengthening the advisory board and financing through public participation and the target is 6% of gdp shall be there which is dream for india from so many years from the independence but still it is not in reality so that dream is there in any 2020 and finally even the regulator will be transformed with so many regulators for different educational organization there will be single regulators for the sole cause and the list of regulators are here which are taking care of the quality deployment and all in the educational forum timelines are proposed till 25 26 the first stage of early, early childhood education and care is taken care of and till 2040 the complete nep is expected to be implemented all this so with this thank you very much for your time and attention and definitely i have tried my level best to complete it but still i think i have encroached your valuable time so i apologize for that and thank you very much thank you for giving me this support over to you sagar thank you so much sir uh, i'm sorry i'm not able to um, uh, you know switch on my video uh, so pardon me for that uh but there are certain questions uh, that the participants would like to ask you so i'm just going to read them out for you go oh, madam uh the first question sir is that the nep has recommended masters degree or a four year bachelor's degree with research as the direct entry into a phd program in such case what is the value of master degree program see now we are in structured way like when we say my my word is in fourth standard everybody knows that he is in primary then secondary school high school degree post graduate as you might have seen that multiple entry multiple exit points anything acquiring that level standards and all you can acquire the degrees so this me phd and all will be depends on your skill sets not on you are admitted to this degrees and completed within 3 years 4 years or 2 years as such so skill sets will have more importance and definitely you have to show that that you acquire certain credit certain outcomes and that skills are in you after evaluation definitely you will be declared as at that level basis okay sir thank you for that uh, there's another question which says uh, rural india journey of education is not easy uh, children from rural areas face many challenges till they finish their education like poor foundation skills access to advanced learning tools financial constraints long distance school sanitation so how can they get online and digital education basically online and digital education is not the only way they are proposing but definitely whatever 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4 model they have proposed wherein major focus has been given to ecce wherein early child care and education is the main focus wherein everybody will be considered under that scheme of central government and it will be rather funded by or uh, subsidized by central government and that's why nep assures that every child will get that particular foundation same in all respect whether he is from rural or uh, urban or he is uh, 
under privileged or well to from well to do type so that disparity definitely this nap is dreaming to remove from our basic education so i don't feel there will be any if it comes in reality i don't feel there will be any disparity as such that this challenges faced by faced by our kids at different location will be the hurdle for their basic foundation that sir i think we have time for one more question and it is a very uh, glaring question that the participant has asked it says uh, doubling the gross enrollment ratio in higher education by 2035 which is one of the stated goals of the policy will mean that we open one university every week for the next 15 years is it possible see currently as well there are so many organizations as well now this policy says there will be no institute as such every every institute will be university in their own and the plan is every district should have at least one university and the bare minimum intake they have proposed for the university is 3000 minimum 3000 intake will be there for the university so i believe definitely within almost uh, 15 years if that particular uh, fund allocation of 6% of gdp is allocated for this education which is dream up till now i don't feel there will be any hurdle in establishing the organizations of this okay. nowadays i may say that so many organizations are under utilized in fact there is no full utilization of resources which are held by different organizations and another aspect is so many players are there private players are there i should not speak on this particular platform but sorry to say most of them are making money and uh, working for profits as such so definitely if that aspect has been removed i think education almost will be free for all of us Okay. Thank you so I, much, sir. Uh, I hope. I of, hope. Sorry. I hope I have clarified the thing. Absolutely, sir. And there are so many uh, other questions that are uh, coming in, but I think we'll have to stop here because of the paucity of time. Uh, maybe we can take them off offline later. Sure, sure, madam. And actually, I'm sorry that I couldn't envisage uh, my presentation was so huge. Most likely, I might have limited to ten or twelve slides. It might be better that. nice way i may pass on the theme or glimpses of nap to our attendees thank you thank you so much sir now i i would uh, request professor sagar to please uh, present the vote of thanks uh, yeah thank you uh, priyanka uh, so thank you all sir for your knowledgeable session and key insights on education formats quality of education and need of nap 2020 you also covered the points on the transforming curriculum and pedagogy structure of 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4 ensuring that there is universal access to education at all levels interactive uh, sessions and the students must have the experiential learning with different evaluation module you also touched upon the points from the ground rule implementation of nep to internationalization tie ups of institute with foreign institute and credit transfer so thank you very much for your key insights and knowledgeable session uh, i am really thankful to you being a student of you as well as lm or vjti so thank you sir once again for the session uh, i also thank uh, to the complete nep team priyanka ma'am chitralekha ma'am directors office uh, archana ma'am and vidya ma'am it team faculty members those who are present presenting here on zoom as well as youtube channel and the dear student participants who are attending the sessions so thank you thank you very much everyone uh, i also request uh, students to fill the feedback form which will be posting on the chat box and you will also get the link uh, once the session gets over so please fill up i request uh, the participant uh, to wait for one one minute so that i can take a screenshot for the record purpose yeah priyanka can you just oh. turn on yeah. you see me Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Just one second. I will just put it over here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. So I will just thank you for the session. Thank you, Ravi sir, for your time being. 
and we also like to thanks sir natkani sir because he connected with you and uh, he is a design guru after all and very well associated with school so thank you sir thank you always and thank you complete team thank you yeah. thank you thank sagar you. thank you ravi sir it was yeah, thank you really fantastic uh, lecture i come across and uh, the journey basically you have gone through it was really the best thing in my life basically thank you sir thank you so much your your talk was very comprehensive you know very no, nice it was, was hurriedly hurriedly wind up basically otherwise <laughs> it may take more time and obviously time is money sure. so thank you sir yeah bye bye thanks a lot everybody thank you all i think we'll end here yeah thank you.